What's up everybody, it's Greg Peters with the Car Passion Channel and today I'll be removing the head from the engine in the 400 horsepower Miata to take a close look at some of my recently acquired valve train damage. Now, if you have no idea what I'm talking about, you can check out my last video where I show you kind of what clued me into the problem and how I diagnosed it. But today I need to rip it apart to really see what is wrong in there and get myself a parts list together so I can get everything ordered and get the head of the machine shop and get my car back together. Now this will be split up into multiple videos because number one, I have to wait for the parts to get here to put the car back together. But I wanna do a video specifically about setting the head up. Uh, I've done a lot of research in the last couple of weeks, specifically about valve springs and seat pressure and all that kind of stuff. So I'm gonna do a real detailed video about that. So hopefully I'll be able to save someone out there some time when they're building a 400 horsepower car and they'll just have one less thing to worry about. But without further ado, let's tear into this thing. So here we are, it's time to pull the VVT Beast engine apart for the first time since it was initially built. That was over four years ago, I can't believe that. So after four years of abuse, I'm excited to tear into this thing and see if I can find any unusual wear or uh, you know suspicious things. I think it's kind of good that I actually have to take the head off because it does give me a chance to check it out inside. You know, being that I'm not sort of any expert engine builder, I really had no idea how long this engine was gonna last. I'm excited that it's even lasted this long, it's got over 13,000 miles on it now, and those have been some abusive miles. I mean, I do not take this car out without doing a pull on it. So anyways, let's tear into this thing and see what it looks like. Let's take a look at the inside of this engine piece by piece, or at least what we have access to. So the first thing I wanna take a look at is the piston tops. You can see the carbon buildup. Now that is completely normal, but what I really wanted to check out was the edges of the pistons. And these babies are super clean. They look as sharp as when I took them out of the box. So for contrast, I'm gonna put another piston on screen here. This is a forged Wiseco piston out of a Miata engine that was subject to heavy detonation. You can see all that pitting around the edge of the piston. Just because you put forged pistons in your engine doesn't mean it can just handle detonation. They're a lot stronger than the factory cast pistons. They can take more abuse, but you still have to have a good tune. And whether you have stock or upgraded pistons, if the detonation is bad enough, it can melt right through the top. As you can see here, the exposed piston ring and your engine is done at that point. The second thing to look at here is the cylinder walls. This line right here is where the top compression ring sits at top dead center. That's why you can see the carbon buildup just in the very top of the cylinder wall. Now, when an engine gets worn out, you'll have something right here called the ring ridge, and that just means the cylinder underneath the top ring has worn out, and you can feel a little ridge right here. Now, this is completely smooth on my engine, so that's a good start. The second thing to notice is the slight brown discoloration between where the top ring and the second ring land at top dead center. Now, at first glance, I thought this was rust, and it was possibly leaking coolant through the head gasket, or maybe one of the times that it sat for a while, 
while with E85. This was some rust from that. Now, side note, E85 or ethanol in general is hygroscopic, which means it attracts and can absorb water, which is good because it pulls water out of your fuel system. But when that water sits in the fuel system, it can cause rust, particularly in the injectors. So you don't want to let your car sit for a long time with E85 in it. Anyways, upon closer inspection, I could see that it was just some carbon buildup, similar to what is shown in the very top of the cylinder, but obviously not near as much because some of the combustion actually does get past the top ring through the gap. So I think that's what that residue is from. Oh, and one more thing, a fun fact that I just learned this week about engines is why the top ring gap is always smaller than the bottom ring gap. It never made any sense to me because I'm like, okay, the top ring is exposed to way more heat, which means it's going to expand more. Why does that one have a smaller gap? So the reason the bottom ring has a bigger gap is so when combustion pressure inevitably gets past the top ring through the ring gap, it can't get trapped in between the two rings and it can easily escape down through the bottom ring because if the pressure gets trapped between the rings, it causes something called ring flutter and that can lead to pressure loss of the combustion chamber, which lowers horsepower. Uh, anyways, I'm going off on like a mega tangent now. I'm gonna link a couple of these articles down below so you can read further for yourselves if you're interested. And the last thing I wanna get into here that's been staring at everyone in the face are these vertical lines. How bad is this scoring? What is this marking right here and over here? First, let's take a look at the two different sides of the cylinder wall. This side right here, the passenger side, looks like it's more worn out than the driver's side. And this is because this side of the engine is called the major thrust side. This cylinder wall right here gets more force put on it by the piston via what's called side loading than this side. And that's based on the direction that the crankshaft rotates. So on a Miata engine, when you look at it head on, it rotates clockwise, which means this side over here is gonna be the major thrust side. Now, obviously this doesn't look too healthy, but is it a normal amount of wear? I have no idea. So I hopped on good old Google and I landed on a site that I trust very much that is Moto IQ. And they have a Miata engine torn apart here and you can see the identical looking wear on this cylinder wall. And exactly what they say is those vertical scuff marks aren't exactly a great sign, but they aren't the end of the world either. It's quite normal for highly loaded piston skirts to wear the sides of the bore a bit. Most importantly, none of those scratches were deep enough to catch a fingernail. That's the same case in my engine. Now, notice what they say here. It's normal for the highly loaded piston skirt to wear the sides of the bore. Now, this was a stock Miata engine that they pulled apart. Keep in mind that the Miata engine you're looking at here makes as much power as a stock Miata in every single cylinder. Let that sink in for a minute. So I'd say the skirts on my pistons are loaded a little bit more than a stock engine. So that's just something to keep in mind. Well, I'm not too concerned here and I'm definitely not gonna rebuild the engine over what looks like somewhat normal cylinder wear. How normal is it? Well, I don't really know anyone with a 400 horsepower Miata that's got 13,000 miles that's also done a tear down to see what the inside of their engine looks like. But the reason I'm showing you guys this is so you have somewhat of a frame of reference and you can say, hey, I know this engine with this many miles, with this much power that's been driven hard and the cylinder walls look like this. Do mine look better or do they look worse? Now I'll put another example on screen here. This is from a Porsche engine and you can see the vertical scoring is significantly worse than what I have in my engine and the mileage on this rebuild was 150. It's not 150,000, that's 150 miles. So that's obviously what I'd consider a pretty catastrophic failure and that thing has to be rebuilt. Mine, I'm just gonna get the head back on and keep on rocking. Okay, why don't we head back into the garage and check things out there. On to the turbocharger. Now I've had this pesky exhaust leak for quite a while and you can see on the gasket exactly where it's leaking. And I was able to compensate for a little while by over tightening that nut, but I highly do not recommend that because what eventually happened is I pulled the stud out of the head. So that's another thing that I've been needing to fix for a while. And the way you can do that is with what's called a time cert kit. And and that is this kit right here that comes with threaded sleeves and you basically drill out the hole that the stud came from to a slightly larger size and then you cut new threads into it, you screw in this sleeve and then voila, you have a new threaded hole that you can put a factory size stud back into. I was actually planning on doing it with the head still in the car 
but now it's going to be even easier. I might even have the machine shop do it for me. But you shouldn't have to over tighten the exhaust manifold nuts to get it to stop leaking. And the reason it was leaking is because the manifold is slightly warped. Now I'm hoping that the machine shop also will be able to just put a nice flat cut across this thing and then I'll throw a new gasket on and we'll be good to go. So not a big deal at all. And I'm thinking once this thing is machined flat, it probably won't warp again because it's already been through all of its heat cycles now and it should just stay good, I think. So anyways, no big deal, easy fix. And then I found this. <laughs> And that's, uh, yeah, the manifold is almost cracked in half, basically. Now, between leaking at the head and leaking from this giant crack, which I couldn't see because it's on the bottom of the manifold, those are absolute spool killers, okay? You can't have any exhaust leaks between the head and the turbo. So once those are fixed, this baby is gonna be spooling harder than ever. And as far as the cracking goes, it's just kind of part of the game with the tubular manifold. That's why companies are always trying to make cast manifolds that flow as well as tubular manifolds or just offer any cast manifold to begin with. Even if it doesn't flow that well, you get the reliability and the bulletproofness of cast, but I was going more for performance. So I went tubular and tubular manifold, especially without a turbo support, they crack eventually. And surprisingly, there's not a single crack around any one of the runners, which is kind of where I expect an exhaust manifold to crack first. So I guess that's a good thing. I also got this Borg Warner installation kit because number one, I needed a new gasket, but number two, I actually lost one of the bolts that holds the turbine housing to the CHRA. At some point it vibrated out. So I needed to get that little triangular bit and one of the bolts to hold everything together. So I figure it'd be a good idea to freshen up the turbo. Pulling the turbo apart here, everything appears to be in most excellent shape. And this baby is just ready to keep on ripping. Shout out to the Gamma Tie turbine wheel. The EFR turbos respond so quickly because the turbine wheel is so lightweight in these things. And no, those are not scrape marks. Those are just from when the wheel was manufactured. So relax in the comments section, okay? Oh yeah, and the EFR installation kit also came with all the different possible gaskets that the various EFRs have. And look at the size difference between my little baby T25 flange and the twin scroll T4 flange. That is probably why you don't really see people run the twin scroll EFRs in Miatas because the housing is just massive. I mean, I'm sure you could fit it, but look at the size difference. Now I was planning on removing the studs from the manifold and having this surface also machined flat, but I started to remove this stud and I could feel that the threads were getting tighter as it was coming out. And at that point I knew I was going to do more harm than good. So I'm just going to leave this in here. It actually wasn't leaking at this flange. So I think with a new gasket, it's going to be fine. These are actually the track speed engineering EFRs. EFR studs, and as far as I know, they're not available anymore, so I really don't want to mess them up. I'm just going to leave this alone. Since I had to remove my ATI damper to replace the front main seal, I took the time to clean off the bolts that hold the trigger wheel in place and throw a good amount of red Loctite on there. Another option here is to tack weld the trigger wheel to the damper, but Car Passion does not have a welder yet, but man, does that need to happen soon. Side note here, if you have the ATI damper, this is the puller type that you have to use. Absolutely do not not use the claw type puller. You will damage the soft aluminum of the pulley. This thing is so easy to use. You just pull these three bolts out of the pulley itself, replace it with the bolts in the kit, throw the puller on, and this thing came right off. Now I do have the updated specs on the ATI damper. I had it machined out to the new tolerance. So it's a little bit easier to get on and off versus the old ones, which were totally a pain, but this thing just came right off. And lastly, let's just take a quick look at the valve train from the underside of the head. I already got a good preview of it through the intake port but you can see here this is an exhaust valve and it looks healthy again it's got that flat surface where it meets up with the valve seat and then over on the intake side these valves are tuluped they have that curvature in them where they meet up with the valve seat and the valve seats look fine. I guess I'll leave that up to the machine shop to determine, but I just wanted to get in here and confirm that I only need a set of intake valves. Now, I'm not gonna disassemble the head in this video because I have a whole nother video with a bunch of other stuff that I have planned and I don't wanna make this video go on forever and ever. And when I get into the valve springs and stuff and some of the new tools that I bought, that really deserves its own video. So we'll get there, but not today. All right, so I found pretty much what I expected in the head. I'm glad to see that the exhaust valves are 
still healthy, so I can just leave those alone. Just need to get a set of intake valves and get the head off to the machine shop. Now, I'm thinking about checking my piston to valve clearance on this engine to see if there's any room to maybe shave the head a little bit. And yes, of course, I could have just selected higher compression pistons from the beginning, but I didn't. And that's in the past, and this is now. And anytime my car breaks, I try to find something to improve on it so it's just a little bit faster after it's all put back together. It's kind of like a reward for going through all the labor and the costs of fixing everything. So anyways, I will see you guys in the next video. If you learned something, don't forget to smash that like button, subscribe if you are new, and I will catch you in the next one. See ya.